lives alone. On April 5th, 1945, a soldier was killed in battle in the Ruhr Valley in Germany, an American soldier. Many others were killed that day from many countries. This American soldier, 2nd Lieutenant Albert Sumner Wetherill III, called Sumner by everyone who knew him, was from Exeter, New Hampshire. He was one of 19 men from Exeter to die during World War II. We know nothing of the circumstances of his death, whether it was a bullet or an explosion, or if he was crushed by a tank. The War Department only reveals killed in action, perhaps to temper the blow. His father, also named Albert Sumner Wetherill, lived on Front Street, he was not a newcomer to tragedy. He'd lost his wife to childbirth in 1925, and a year later, that child, just a year old, died of scarlet fever. All this happened when young Sumner was just a boy. Sumner and his sisters, Jane and Elizabeth, had felt the losses deeply. Maybe this was why he didn't rush to enlist as soon as Pearl Harbor was attacked in December of 1941. He didn't come from a military family. His grandfather, the first Albert Sumner Wetherill, had been too young to serve in the Civil War and his father too old for World War I. Sumner's grandfather became a druggist back in the days when compounding medicines required no formal schooling. Born in Maine, he'd studied his trade at a drugstore in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Within three years, he moved to Exeter and set up shop on Water Street. In 1896, he completely renovated his stodgy looking old drugstore, proudly placing the tools of his trade, a mortar and pestle on the rooftop. It's still there, although a toy store now lives in the old building. The mortar and pestle looks small from the ground, but it's actually four feet tall, the height of a third grader. Think about that next time you're looking at it. The tools of one's trade, the size of a third grader, the size of a brownie or a Cub Scout. He may have wanted his own son, Albert Sumner Wetherill Jr., to become a pharmacist as well. He certainly prepared him well. Albert Jr. went to Governor Dummer Academy in Phillips Exeter. He would have been well prepped for the new scientific work of the pharmacist, based less on folk remedy and trial and error, and more on chemistry. But it was not to be. The most educated of the Albert Sumner Wetherills was lured away by the sputtering, noisy, exciting promise of the new century, the automobile. After his father's death, Albert Jr. opened a garage and car dealership on Franklin Street, if not the first, then among the first such establishments in town. His son Sumner, the reluctant soldier, would also be pulled away from the books and into the world of machines. The wrench and the torque rod fit into Sumner's hands like they'd grown there. He didn't need a high school diploma to fix cars. Each completed job brought a crescendo of sound as a machine, well-greased, leaped into action, transporting its owners on journeys both short and long. It was very satisfying work. He joined the fire department, becoming a full member of the Hook and Ladder Company in 1940. In 1941, the department reached, recorded 119 calls. Sumner Wetherill and the Hook and Ladder weren't called for all of them, but they were ready. And most likely, Sumner was handy if the truck needed repairs. He was also elected as assistant scoutmaster to Boy Scout Troop 193 in Exeter, and within a year he was acting scoutmaster, leading boys into the outdoors, teaching them the skills they needed for camping and survival. His troop was awarded a blue ribbon for camping proficiency at the Stratum Camperie in the fall of 1940, and assisted in the successful search for a missing scout that weekend. But by the middle of 1942, it became harder to avoid the war. Men from the town were leaving, either drafted or enlisted. In July, Sumner joined them. He was 25, a few years older than most recruits, but with only three years of high school and no diploma, he enlisted as a private, listing his civilian occupation as semi-skilled, driver of bus, taxi, truck, or tractor, probably just a checkoff box on the form. His basic training was at Camp Wheeler in Georgia in July. <laughs> Tough climate for a northern boy. 
It was at Camp Wheeler that his leadership skills, honed in the fire department and scouting, were recognized. As soon as BASIC was completed, he shipped off to Camp Hood in Texas for Officers Candidate School, graduating as a second lieutenant. That winter, he was given a brief leave and returned to Exeter for what would be the last time. A photo taken during this visit is in the collections of the Exeter Historical Society. He stands next to his smiling sister Elizabeth, who is herself in the uniform of the waves. In spite of the smile, it's a stiff photo. A young man about to face battle, uncertain of what the future holds, not unlike the statue behind me. Our statue was sculpted in 1922 after the first war to end all wars by Daniel Chester French. French, like Sumner Wetherill, was an Exeter native. He dedicated two of his statues in 1922, this one and the seated Abraham Lincoln in Washington, D.C. in the Lincoln Memorial. French had been a boy during the Civil War. He'd seen the toll war takes on families and towns, and he made a very conscious decision to sculpt this soldier without his uniform hat. He didn't want to romanticize war by making the figure too eager. Instead, there's a look of hesitancy, not fear, but uncertainty. You see it here, you'll also see it in the face of Sumner Wetherill in a photo taken just before he shipped out. And then he left. Don't worry, Dad, Betty, Jane, I'll be back. Albert Wetherill, his father, the auto dealer, waited. 1945 came and the war was almost over. April, almost over and the Allies were making the final push into Nazi Germany. Every day brought news of territory gained. Hearts were hopeful. They would be coming home soon. The waiting would be over. On a Saturday night, April 21st, Albert received news that his son Sumner was missing in action. Purgatory for a parent. He spent two more days hoping against hope that his son would be found that some miracle had happened and maybe the platoon he was leading would come upon him, injured but alive in the chaos. But they didn't. On Monday, word arrived from the War Department. Second Lieutenant Albert Sumner Wetherill III, killed in action, age 28. He would never marry, never father a son who might be the next Albert Sumner Wetherill, never meet the nieces and nephews who would come along. His name was inscribed on the family gravestone in the Exeter Cemetery. You'll pass right by it if you follow the parade into the cemetery. Look to the right toward the back of the cemetery near Arbor Street. His name is listed below that of his mother and his infant brother. The family's grief was shared by the town as it shared the grief of the other 18 families who lost their sons. A shared loss, grief not weathered alone. Far, far away in the American War Cemetery in Margraten, Netherlands. Sumner Wetherill was laid to rest along with 10,000 other Americans who died in the war. There's a gloominess that can come over us when we think about our townsmen buried in such a distant land. Who remembers Albert Sumner Wetherill? We lost his mechanical skills, his leadership of men and boys, his understanding of the burden of his generation. We are the mother town in this statue, asking so much and losing so much more. We can pledge ourselves every year to not forget the men and women who die in war, but it's hard when we leave them so far away. There's another mother statue similar to ours that stands watch over the fallen soldiers in the Margraten Cemetery. Separated by thousands of miles, their sisterhood binds them together. And Albert Sumner Wetherill is not forgotten. In March of this year, the Historical Society received an email from John Essers of Margraten in English, which is hard for him. He wrote, many years ago, I've adopted the grave of a soldier named Albert Sumner Wetherill. Six times in a year, I bring flowers to his grave, and so do I remember him and what he has done for us in World War II. Every time when I stand on his grave, I think also for what man he has been 
and if he still has family in the USA. What what for, what for man he has been? He was a leader, Mr. Essers. He was our leader. And he still has family in the USA, family that are here today. As part of a larger project called the Faces of Margraten, Mr. Essers requested information and a photo of the man whose grave he tends with such loving care. We sent him the photo of Sumner and his sister, that last photo taken in his hometown. In the beginning of May, it was displayed along with thousands of others in the cemetery. In this way, the organization explains, Dutch citizens will give a face to their U.S. liberators as a unique tribute to their sacrifices. We think we live our lives alone, but we don't. We can't. We share. We live in shared space, and we share our history with other places and other people. Let's recommit ourselves to grasp for peace so that we no longer have a reason to build memorials to these young lives lost. And whether we're old enough to remember war or young enough to be the same size as a rooftop mortar and pestle, we hold the memories of those already lost dear.